Preston Pans in Scotland. In July 2010, this small coastal town launched one of Scotland's most ambitious art projects in recent times. Over 200 volunteers from right across Scotland and a few even from further beyond answered the call to commemorate an event which took place here in Preston Pans 265 years before. These volunteers, working to designs by Andrew Crummy, were striving to create one of the longest embroideries in the world. And at 105 meters long, it is an achievement worthy of the story that it tells. Scotland in 1745 was a land divided. The ancient royal house of Stuart was in exile, and the house of Hanover ruled in Great Britain. It was the reign of King George II, but now there arose a serious challenge to his throne. Charles Edward Stuart, the bonny prince of legend, had landed in Scotland to reclaim his heritage. In the face of disappointment and discouragement, Charles created an army out of nothing and marched to challenge the king's authority. That authority was represented by General Sir John Cope and his professional army of red-coated soldiers. Two kings claiming one crown, two armies battling for a nation. This is the Battle of Preston Pan's Tapestry. Our tale begins in 1744 at the Palazzo Mutti in Rome. A father and son share a tender goodbye. But this is no ordinary family, as these are the royal Stuarts. Prince Charles leaves his father behind as the French king has promised to help him to regain their throne. But the French plans are in vain. A terrible storm rises up as if from nowhere. The great armada is scattered wide and dashed to pieces. The French lose heart, and Charles is forced to seek his own aid. But he doesn't give up, and by the 22nd of June 1745, he is at Saint Nazaire, ready to begin his adventure. He has been working hard. Somehow, Charles has found the means to hire two fine ships the Dutai, which he boards himself, and the Elizabeth, which he fills with weapons, supplies, and 700 French soldiers. But misfortune strikes again, and King George's HMS Lion intercepts this tiny invasion force. The powerful guns of the Elizabeth give battle. Hour after hour the cannons pound, splintering timbers and striking down sailors. Battered and crippled, both the Lion and the Elizabeth limp back to their home ports. Charles' little ship du Tai is now alone with few supplies and without those crucial French soldiers. Yet Charles refuses to turn back, and he presses on through stormy seas as he continues towards his goal, Scotland. And on the 23rd of July, he finally arrives on the soft sands of Eriske. Disguised, his face hidden behind a new beard, Charles has at last reached the land which he intends to rule. He strides proudly ashore, dropping behind him as he goes the seeds which will grow to become known as Prince Charlie's Rose. But the prince receives but a lukewarm welcome. Nobody had imagined that he would dare to come alone. Go home, begs MacDonald of Boysdale. I am come home, retorts the prince. Ignoring these warnings, Charles Edward sails further, landing on the mainland near Arisaig. Here he knew he would find his destiny. The following days are spent at his desk in Borrowdale House, writing to the nearby lords and chiefs. Without a French army, Charles would simply have to raise one for himself. Support begins to gather. The Macdonalds have answered his call, and with Clan Ranald, Keppoch and Glencoe, Charles can at last drink the health of his father, King James VIII of Scotland and the Third of England. Yet the Macdonalds alone hardly constitute an army. The days drag on as Charles paces about at Borrowdale, anxious, worried, and vulnerable. But he remains determined. He will not abandon his enterprise so soon. And so the weapons and supplies are ordered ashore from the Dutai, and the ship is prepared for departure. 
But before it leaves, Charles meets there with Lochiel. Cameron of Lochiel, the most powerful of the Western chiefs. He too warns Charles that the risks are too great. But Charles's passion wins him over. I will share the fate of my prince, Lochiel vows. And so, Charles can send away his ship and begin his advance. He has set a rendezvous for his supporters and the deadline now approaches. So the prince advances into Moidart and his tiny army swells a little. John Murray joins him here and word begins to spread throughout the land that Charles Stuart has come home, whilst those few who had landed with him are fast becoming legends. The Seven Men of Moidart, a strange band of English, Scots and Irish, some soldiers, some great lords, all loyal. But word of these momentous events has travelled fast. It is the 16th of August now and news has reached Edinburgh. The chimneys there heave with smoke as every oven in the mighty city bakes loaves by the hundred for King George's army. War is coming. Indeed, it has already begun. A small group of redcoat soldiers patrolling in the north is ambushed near Highbridge. The Highlanders open fire from behind rocks and trees, invisible to their enemy. And confused and believing themselves surrounded, the redcoats surrender. And the small band of Highlanders continues on its road towards the rendezvous. Charles, too, is headed that way. At Dalali, he meets the great poet Alexander MacDonald as he boards the galley boats. On the 19th of August, a small flotilla ferries the prince and his forces up Loch Shiel as they make their way towards the agreed meeting place, Glen Finnan. Whilst at that same moment, the British army loyal to King George is advancing out of Edinburgh, determined to crush this rebellion before it gets out of control. And at Glen Finnan, at last, Charles's wait is over. Lochiel has returned to him now, this time with over 600 men at his command. Other clans are here too, and Charles finally has the makings of his army. And so, with great joy, the royal standard is raised, and to great cheers and whoops from the men, their bonnets filling the air, Charles promises them all a victory which will never be forgotten. The 1745 Rising has now begun. i mm -hmm. 